Diver Anon here, I'm back with some more stories from my colleagues around the world. Please sit around the campfire and enjoy a good old-fashioned thread they don't make em like they used to. Have you heard of the raptures of the deep? Few people have. 30 meters below the surface, water pressure alters the properties of gases within the human body. What was once harmless or vital begins to poison your mind. The deeper the depth, the deadlier the poison becomes. Symptoms include, impairment, euphoria, laughter, anxiety, hallucinations, hysteria, terror, and death. And yet, we still venture into these depths, risking our lives and minds. Delving into a place where the barrier between the mind and reality becomes thin. Those of us who return can bring with us only memories of that alien world beneath the waves. These are some of those memories. Tales from beyond the depths of. I'm a professional diver anon. I posted a story of mine a couple weeks ago or so. Not going to write it up again but to to give the gist of it, I was doing body recovery on contract for the police, found a body and attached a line and started swimming to the surface when something grabbed the body and started dragging it at incredible speed. I cut the line just in time to prevent myself from being yanked down with it. I'm sure some of you deep sea loving anons will remember it. I've got a couple other stories of my own that. I can go into more depth if you guys want. Mostly stuff involving fish that were a bit too big for comfort coming to take a look while I was doing some welding, or that time my rebreather malfunctioned and I started having a full-blown drug trip while I was 200m underwater. Fun stuff. I've got a ton of more interesting stories though, mostly from other divers. I can't speak to the truth of them because I wasn't there. Some are pretty, out there. Keep in mind, some of these stories are sort of like diver urban legends, they get passed around until nobody can remember where they got started. The story I'm about to tell you though, I heard from a good friend of mine, a dive master and the guy who trained me on my first dives. I have no reason to believe he's lying. This was back sometime in the late 80s I believe. My friend, let's call him Frank, had just gotten out of the navy and started doing civilian work. Mostly welding, and he worked with the police for a short time like I did. Like me for Frank, diving was both a hobby and a job. So he would spend his weekends exploring known shipwrecks and points of interest known to the local diving community. Sometimes he would just set anchor in a random spot and dive down to see what he could find. He usually found a whole lot of nothing, but on this particular occasion he hit the jackpot. Metaphorically speaking, because there was nothing good about what he found. He was doing an extreme depth dive that day, which as I explained in my last post. I'm not going to name the lake he was diving in just in case it somehow leads back to him, but it was a very large lake that was 900 plus feet deep. So he was pushing the boundaries a bit, especially since he was solo diving without any partners. He gets to the bottom, and as per usual there's just the usual sand, silt and some rocks covered with algae. Not even any fish that he could see. He digs around in the sand a bit to see if he can find anything, and he feels something hard and smooth buried a few inches under the surface. Frank grabs it and tries to take a look at it a bit further up away from the floating sand. It was some sort of prescription bottle with the label worn slash torn off. So he puts it off to the side and keeps digging, finds something much bigger right away. He pulls it out of the sand, and to his shock he's staring at a human skull. He digs around in the sand some more to find the bones, pretty much feeling his way around because the fine sediments he was digging up made his visibility zero. He found something else hard and pulled it out, but it wasn't another bone. It was another skull. He kept digging and found on his estimate at least 200, likely more, skeletal remains at the bottom. Mixed in with the skeletons were, he estimated, thousands upon thousands of prescription bottles like the one he found earlier. He didn't have enough oxygen slash time to stay down for long, so he dug around in a few spots to see how large the dump of bodies and bottles was. He estimated it must have been almost 50 by 50 feet roughly in size. So it's possible that there could have been many, many more bodies there than his estimate. 
probably the spoopiest bit is, since he had done work with the police he knew what a body looks like underwater at various stages of decomposition. The bones had been picked clean by the fish, but the bones themselves couldn't have been there for much longer than five years. Like a good citizen Frank carried one of the skull pieces up with him to the surface. He talked to some of the people he'd worked in the police with as a diver, and they immediately told him that they were not going to investigate and that he should never speak about it again. Being someone who valued his own skin, Frank did just that, and ended up moving to the other side of the country about a year later. He never told me why, but I've got the feeling that he no longer felt safe working slash living there. I was doing a recovery dive in a local lake for the police, some idiot kid who hadn't worn his life jacket while drinking on a party boat. It was deep enough to require mixed gas to avoid narcosis. I was following all the normal protocols, keeping in contact with my diving partner, watching my dive computer. It doesn't take long to get to the bottom, getting back up always takes much longer. Me and my partner split up to cover more ground because visibility was extremely low. It must have been about five minutes before I saw it. There was a human silhouette standing upright at the bottom of the lake. I swam closer and found a man, perfectly preserved without a sign of decay on his body. He was buried in silt up to his shins. It really looked like he could still be alive, or had only been dropped into the water a few moments ago. I tied a line to him and started to head back up to the surface so I could get the boat team to haul up the body. So I swim up, letting the line play out behind me until I reach my first safety stop. While I'm waiting for my body to decompress so I can head further up, I notice that the spool of line is still being pulled out even though I've stopped. It's completely taut and rolling out straight down at a blistering speed. It takes me about half a second to realize that my reel is about to run out and I'm about to be sucked down by the line. There's a good 900 plus feet on my line, and the speed it was being reeled out was so tremendous that as soon as I tried to grab it, my hand was split almost completely open to the bone. In retrospect that was a dumb thing to do, but it was just basic instinct to grab the rope and try to cut it with my knife. I get a sudden IQ boost and instead cut the straps holding the reel to my suit a few seconds before the line runs out and it vanishes into the murky water within about half a second. I feel as if the force of the whiplash alone would have been strong enough to break my back and kill me if I hadn't cut the straps. I'm pretty shaken at this point, more shaken than I've been since I found my first dead kid. But still I manage to ascend slowly and take my safety spots despite the pain, fear, and of course all the blood leaking out of my hand. Good thing this was a fresh water dive, or I might have been in real trouble on my way up. Anyway, my knee-jerk reaction and what everyone else told me was that it was narcosis-fueled hallucinations. Divers see all sorts of shit when narcosis kicks in, I've heard stories of fish and squid with human faces, some guy swears he was face to face with Cthulhu. My point is, narcosis is to an extent like temporarily being on DMT, and it can make you see some absolutely crazy shit. The thing I can't make sense of is how I got the cut on my hand. It's clearly from a rope, it's not clean enough to be from my knife or any other sharp object. The doctor even noted that I had friction burns all surrounding the cut. So what the fuck caused the cut if I was hallucinating? And if I wasn't hallucinating, what the fuck could drag out a line that fast? What really keeps me up at night is that the guy was resting on the bottom of the lake, and my line was going straight down. So either he was pulled through the bottom of the lake, or something with incredible strength and speed grabbed my rope and was reeling me in like a fish. I'm not sure which is worse. My first story of the night is not set in the depths of the ocean, but rather on the surface. This story was told to me by the captain of a ship I was on for research work. A good Aussie chap, he always had a good yarn or story to tell about life at sea. At the beginning of his career on the sea, he was the greenhorn on a commercial deep sea fishing trawler. They mostly caught black cod, though a lot of other fish got caught in the net and discarded. He said that the deeper you laid your nets, the stranger the things you'd pull to the surface would be. Beyond a certain depth the fish become inedible, their flesh transforming into a pale, 
gelatinous substance not long after reaching the surface. One night in particular it seems, this crew set their nets too deep. As the nets raise out of the water, dripping wet and filled with pale wriggling flesh, it became apparent that something was wrong. The fish were screaming. The noise was unbearable, some of the crew ran below deck and the rest put in earplugs. After some debate, they opened up the net on the deck to examine the fish. The captain swore that when they did, he saw fish with human faces. Distorted, corpulent, distended, bit unmistakably human. And they were screaming. Pale blobs of flesh with a drooping face, fleshy nose, and black eyes, wretchedly screaming in anger, pain or hate. They were quickly thrown overboard and the crew fished in shallower waters from that point onward. Okay, time for one of my own shorter stories. Frank has more interesting stories than me, but I want to share some stuff from my own personal experiences as well. This actually happened just last year. I was doing some maintenance slash repair work on a dam for an artificial lake. I had chosen this spot to work in particular because it was a treasure trove for exploration as a diver. Since the lake was artificial, there were several small villages, farms and homes that had been submerged when it was constructed, something that's actually surprisingly common when it comes to artificial lakes. So I was down at the bottom of the dam, doing a visual inspection of the gate guides and seal plates, trying to find anything that needed maintenance or replacement. It was summer, so the water was pretty murky and visibility was low. Something shoved slash nudged me on the back and I turned around expecting to see my dive partner, but instead I was starting right at the face of the biggest, ugliest catfish I've ever seen. Water does weird things to your perception of size, but I could swear this thing must have been the size of a small SUV. If it had wanted to, it could have eaten me no problem. I froze in place because I hadn't expected to be in danger from the aquatic wildlife on a freshwater dive, but he swam away and circled around for a while as I worked. It's actually fairly common, fish watching you while you work but I've never seen one as big as this before. I'm just glad he wasn't hungry. Back again. This is another story from Frank, if you remember him from one of the earlier deep sea threads I posted in. In case you weren't in those threads, Frank was my diving instructor. Absolute legend, been around a while and seen lots of strange shit. He never told me exactly where slash when this took place, it's kind of irrelevant in any case. He was taking a group of new diver trainees out on a dive for their certification. Usually they start you out in shallow water, after a few dives they take you out somewhere deeper. Frank goes out into the ocean a ways to get you used to the sensation of being underwater and being unable to see the bottom. It's an important thing to get used to if you're a diver. There's lots of places where the shelf will become a sheer drop-off for potentially hundreds of meters straight down into nothing but abyss. If you're not used to it, just seeing it can induce panic and terror in certain people. The deep does that to certain people and I would recommend not becoming a diver if you have some sort of phobia or fear of deep water. Facing your fears is great and all, but having a panic attack while you are 40m underwater is a bad idea. Frank said and people who got panicked slash scared of deep open water were pretty common. Hell, I got pretty scared my first time. But he says there's another reaction he's seen. He's only seen it once, but he's heard of it from other diving instructors. The only way he could describe it is the call of the deep. They dropped into the water off the boat, and Frank could immediately tell something was off. This kid hung back from the group, staring down into the water. Frank tried to pull him back, but he shook off his arm and started swimming away. Straight down. Frank waited a second, then started after him. He caught up at about 30 m and grabbed the his leg. The kid looked back at him and smiled, then pushed away and continued going straight down. Frank followed him for a bit and tried to stop him again, but the guy just kept going further and further down. Eventually, Frank had to stop and let him go or risk dying himself. To this day, Frank says it is the most unnerving shit he's ever seen. What could possibly compel a man to just swim straight down into the ocean? What did he think awaited him down there? 
the kid's body was never found, the parents sued Frank but he was exonerated by the testimony of the other trainees who backed up his claims. Police chalked it up to the kid being suicidal, but I'm pretty sure there's a long list of better ways to kill yourself. And like I said, this isn't an isolated incident. No cause or motivation has ever been determined, and the reason for why these people swim to their deaths remains a mystery. The next story is one of my own. Those of you who have been in previous threads might recall me talking about this briefly. I was doing a mixed gas dive to the bottom which was 60m at this part of the lake. Mostly I was just looking for valuables or other odds and ends that had ended up at the bottom of the lake. When I was a kid, I lost a tooth on a boat trip. I think that was when my fascination with the deep began. My mind fixated on the idea of my tooth, sinking to the murky bottom and lying there. Lost to the depths, forever. I enjoy finding those lost things and bringing them back to the surface. It's so rare that you can bring something tangible with you from the deep. On this particular day, I brought back with me something that was intangible, yet infinitely more valuable than any treasure. I still had over half my cylinder and was enjoying skimming over the lake floor, sifting through the sediment and whatever odds and ends had ended up there. Out of the blue I had a powerful intuition that I was being watched. I turned around and saw a man standing there behind me on the ocean floor. He smiled at me broadly and waved his hand. That's when I recognized him, in a sort of stilted shock. I was face to face with my dead father on the lake floor, 60m below the surface. He pointed to my cylinder and said something, his face wrinkled with concern. Well, he tried to speak. When he opened his mouth, only bubbles came out and I couldn't understand what he was trying to say. He pointed again, directly at my oxygen regulator. It slowly dawned on me what was happening. My equipment was malfunctioning, giving me an improper mix of gases that at this depth, can result in raptures of the deep, narcosis. At this point, I was aware of the fact that I was hallucinating. I should have started swimming back up immediately. But I couldn't. I had left so much unsaid to my father. He had died in a boating accident a few years before, and I hadn't ever really gotten over it. He was just there one moment and gone the next. I never said goodbye. You have certain regrets when someone dies, things left unsaid. I always mulled them over in my mind. I wish I'd said this. Why didn't I tell him that before I died? And I finally had a chance to tell him those things. To have that goodbye. But I couldn't speak, because of the stupid rebreather in my mouth. I started to rip off my mask and rebreather so I could talk to him, but he grabbed my hand. I yanked against him and tried to pull off my mask, but he wouldn't let me. Frustrated, I screamed into my mask, bubbles floating up around me in a stream up to the surface. And then, I felt him pull me into a hug. The kind he used to give me when I was a little kid. And in that instant, I just knew that he understood. That he knew. That this was him saying goodbye. When the bubbles cleared, he was gone. I swam back up the surface, spent a few minutes at my safety stop and then surfaced. I know it wasn't real, that it couldn't possibly be real. Besides, I don't believe in ghosts. I know I didn't really see my father, or my father's ghost down there. It was probably a manifestation of my subconscious desire or some shit, I'm not a psychologist. Even still, it's hard for me to not want to believe that it was real in some small way. That my mind was more, open, in that state and he reached out. I'm not sure why. I guess it's just that. It felt like he was there. It felt like him. It felt so goddamn much like him. God, I miss him. The whole. This story comes from the father-in-law of a young diver that Frank trained. We'll call him Ibrahim. The area of the world Ibrahim is from has a long cultural history of diving, long preceding modern scuba gear. An entire culture developed over the ages of the songs and stories of the pearl divers, venturing into the depths in hope of finding hidden treasures. 
and like with all things, the sea gives and takes in equal measure. For every beautiful, luminous gem of the deep taken from her, the sea will take something in return. Sometimes a ring, an heirloom, a jeweled diving knife. Sometimes much more. There is one legend among these pearl divers that has apparently existed in one form or another since antiquity. The name is in their native language, but it roughly translates to, the chasm, or, the hole. It's common to hear it referred to amongst pearl divers talking about a lost friend or comrade. The hole got him. So, what is the hole? It's not a place, apparently so much as it is a, thing. It supposedly appears without warning, silently sucks a victim into its gaping maw and vanishes without warning. The divers don't describe it as a creature, though they do speak as if it is a living thing. Descriptions of supposed survivors speak of a giant circular chasm opening beneath them in the sea floor, with a strong current sucking unfortunate divers down into its abyssal blue depths, never to be seen again. I'm going to begin tonight with one of my own stories that I haven't told yet. We're also going to try and investigate the phenomenon I witnessed, which has been corroborated and seen by many other commercial and hobby divers. If you've been diving a lot or spend a lot of time around divers, you might have already guessed what I'm talking about. Black Divers, one of the most persistent and unnerving legends that has plagued diving since the time of giant metal bell helmets. We'll dig into possible causes and explanations for this phenomena after I've written up my own encounter with them. This story comes from early in my time as a commercial diver on the Hibernia rig. The rig is the biggest in the world and is absolutely massive. Basically a small city jutting out of the sea floor. The entire thing is on top of a massive concrete platform settled on the bottom of the ocean that's also used to store barrels of crude. Even back when I was doing this, safety regulations were very important. Unlike most of my other jobs where I mostly inspect slash repair the integrity of the structures themselves, I was checking the oil storage itself to ensure it was safe, secure, and not leaking out of containment. It was good work, steady work inspecting the site nearly every day and it paid well. Usually I worked with a group of two other divers. The day this happened was like pretty much any other. The weather was shit. The onboard chef's omelette was delicious and the rig workers were assholes. Nothing new. Began the dive, reached my target and began the inspection of lids, seams, ECT and taking water samples as well to ensure no minute particulate leakage. After a few minutes, I get a feeling on the back of my neck that I'm being watched. I turn around to see one of my partners floating a distance away from me, watching me work. I wave at him and give the OK sign to signify they I am OK, and he returned it. I wasn't sure why he was watching me instead of doing his own work, but I really didn't give much of a shit. I had a feeling in my gut though, that something wasn't right. I molded over in my mind while I worked. Something about him had seemed off, but I had no idea what it was. So I turned around again after a bit and sure enough he was still there, watching me. I waved to him and made the, OK, hand sign and again, he returned it. Something about the way he did it made me feel disgusted and repulsed. The fingers looked, wrong. If that makes any sense. I don't remember enough detail to describe exactly how they moved incorrectly, but I felt a distinct uncanny valley level repulsion upon seeing it. I was looking at something very, very wrong. My gut instinct was screaming at me that this guy was dangerous. That's when I realized what had actually been bugging me initially. The guy didn't have any bubbles coming out of his regulator. Oh shit, this guy has a regulator. My diving partner has a rebreather. This isn't my diving partner. Wait oh shit, how the fuck can this guy be giving off zero bubbles without a rebreather? Here's where I need to explain a bit of technical stuff for the non-initiated. Regulators are those typical scuba masks you see. You breath in air from them and exhale into the sea. Rebreathers are much bulkier and they recycle the air you're exhaling and reuse it so that you get more bang for your buck. Better for longer slash deeper dives than a regulator. Regulators make bubbles, rebreathers don't. 
Like I said, all our guys on the rig used rebreathers, it was company policy and it was just full stop the best option. This diver was using a regulator and on top of that, he wasn't making any bubbles. Which is just screaming all kinds of wrong. I stare at him for a second as he just floats there, staring back at me through the gloomy water. My stupid search and rescue slash recovery instincts kick in and I assume this diver is having an emergency malfunction with his rebreather and cannot breath and is possible already unconscious or dead. So I try and stuff down the blaring warning signs in my gut and swim over to him as quickly as I can. The warning signs in my gut get worse the closer I get, there's just something about this guy that is wrong, somehow. I can't describe it in any other way than that I knew instinctively that he should not exist. That he was wrong. My gut finally got the better of me just as I reached to pull off his broken regulator so we could share my rebreather on our way up. I stopped my hand a few inches away from the mask, and I felt an intense jolt of fear staring down into his mask. There was nothing behind his mask. It was completely empty. No eyes, no face, no skull, no corpse, nothing. Just empty blackness. I reached out with my hand and touched the top of his head. His wetsuit hood squished inwards as I pushed, deforming the shape of his head. That's when it moved. The thing turned its mask up towards my face, raising its hand and making the OK sign again. My body was in full fight or flight mode at this point and though I'm no pussy, spooky phantom divers are pretty far past my limits of what I'm willing to fight. So I swam the fuck away, putting a decent distance between us before I dared to look back. When I turned to look I saw the diver floating backwards into the current, leaking black oil or blood or something from his mask, arms and legs. It wasn't long before he was hidden entirely behind a black cloud, vanishing into the murky sea. I went back up to the surface as quickly as humanly possible, assuming that I had a bad mix of gas or a malfunctioning rebreather causing narcosis. The maintenance crews and never found anything wrong with my gear, though that doesn't rule out the possibility of narcosis hallucinations. So as promised, a bit of analysis slash insight into this particular phenomenon. There's a couple different names for them. Phantom divers, ghost divers, black divers. The stories aren't all the same. There's two basic types of phantom diver encounters. The ones with a body, and the ones without. Some people report seeing a corpse slash skeleton face behind the mask, others saw what I saw which is a seemingly empty black void with nothing inside except water. The common thread shared through most stories is the lack of bubbles, and the black blood slash mist emitted by the phantom diver. Not all stories have the black mist, but the majority do. There's a couple possibilities for this. It could be an actual supernatural phenomenon. Weird shit happens in the ocean. Divers die all the time. Could the ocean have some sort of property that traps the souls of those who die there, dooming them to float aimlessly on currents as ghostly phantoms? I won't outright rule it out, because weird shit happens in the ocean. I've seen stuff defies explanation time and time again. It could also be what I like to call a mind virus. You see it a lot amongst the DMT slash psychedelics community. The drugs are a window into your subconscious thought process. So if you go in with certain expectations or knowledge even if you don't realize you are, it will affect your experience. It's possible that people see phantom divers because they've heard stories about them, and it's something their subconscious mind jumps to when it experiences narcosis hallucinations. Which would mean that by spreading these stories, I am in fact contributing to the spread of this idea. The last possibility is very much related to the next story I have for you, I'll save it for after I have typed it up. Describe how the fingers were wrong. It happened quite a while ago and my memory is far from perfect. If I said that I remembered the exact detail of what made the fingers wrong, I'd be lying. There was something about the way they moved when he made the hand signal. It was like someone had studied exactly how a human hand functions without ever having a hand or using it. 
and so there was just something missing in translation, an innate humanity in the gesture that was completely absent. This next story was written by the same old biologist who allegedly had a deep sea ROV he was operating eaten by the black carpet back in one of the first threads I posted on here. Link for anyone who missed that thread. One of the biggest questions we face as a species is the question of sentience. What makes us sentient? What allows us to exist, consciously? Self-aware. Why do we exist? That's what fuels our search for other life, out there in the stars. But I would posit that we are searching in exactly the wrong direction. The effort, time and resources to reach the stars are vast, and our chances of discovering any life, let alone intelligence, sapient, sentient life are astronomically small. That isn't to say that we shouldn't explore the stars, only that we should finish exploring our own planet first. 80% of the Earth's oceans are unmapped, unseen, unexplored. Dark chasms of unknown depths never seen by human eyes, teeming with undiscovered species and wonders. What are the chances that some undiscovered form of intelligent life exists, somewhere in those unfathomable depths? Very, very likely. In fact, I am nearly certain that it does exist. I've seen the evidence with my own two eyes. It was another voyage, chasing after that profane and accursed siphonophore. The blasted thing has ruined my academic credibility and resisted my best efforts to record, observe, or prove its existence. I have not given up the search, but I grow more discouraged every year my prize eludes me. Even so, I saw something on this dive perhaps even more shocking, intriguing and abominable than that even the titanic black carpet of creeping flesh that lies at the deepest depths of the abyss. One of my remote hydrophones had picked up a sound unlike any I've ever heard in the ocean. I was entirely convinced that the colossal siphonophore himself was in the vicinity, and pushed ahead at flank speed towards the site, hoping to dive before the bastard could move on and vanish into the depths again. After agonizing hours spent staring at the horizon, Willing my boat to crash faster through dark and unforgiving seas, I arrived at the location of my hydrophone. The dive took place mere minutes after my arrival, as I intended to waste as little time as possible and had gotten fully suited and prepared while my destination was yet an hour distant. As swiftly as I had arrived, still swifter I dove to the bottom, some 700 feet beneath the curling whitecaps and seething foam. My flashlight was the only illumination in the inky darkness, playing upon the innumerable tiny flotsam particles and microscopic plankton floating upwards on unseen current from still greater depths. As I dove, it became quickly apparent that several large barracuda shadowed my descent, each specimen measuring nearly 8 feet in length. These inquisitive creatures are quite harmless to humming, despite what deceitful luciferian hysteriatic media sycophants might try to tell you. I felt no fear at witnessing these noble wolves of the sea, and instead welcomed their company. To my immense disappointment, two of the creatures vanished in pursuit of a large blue tuna, leaving me with only a singular companion as I plunged headfirst deeper into the abyss. Eventually, he too left me. I was alone with my thoughts for what seemed an eternity. Ever so slowly, the ocean floor came into view through tear murky darkness. I beheld a great underwater plateau perched at the edge of a steep plunge into even greater depths. A swift shadow shot out of the gloom at the plateau's edge in the corner of my vision, and I whirled to face the new danger. To my great relief and surprise, the silhouette belonged to none other than an exquisite bottlenose. The dolphin swum triumphant arcs round me, squill chittering in his strange language in obvious delight to himself for having found a friendly light in such dark depths. Despite the affications and welcome from my new friend, I urgently pressed downward to the floor of the plateau with my companion in tow. I imagined at that moment that he must have been following out of sheer curiosity. What was this land ape doing alone at such a depth during the night? This land ape was on the hunt for big game. The biggest game ever to walk the Oshab floor, perhaps. But I was not destined to find my old bane the colossal siphonophore today. 
for upon reaching the plateau floor I quickly noticed strange unnatural shapings shaping amongst the rock and coral. Sections worn and carved by water but seemingly with intent, purpose and craftsmanship. Strange groove lines ran in circles on the stone seabed, each pattern simile and yet distinct. Astonished, I began to photograph and record as much of this incredible phenomenon as I could, taking video and photo in great detail of the structures. After my manic enthusiasm had waned somewhat, I turned to look for my bottlenosed companion. I found him sitting only a short distance away, staring at me with eyes that had suddenly lost their gleaming laughter. That was when it struck me like a bolt of thunder, bottlenose dolphins never swim this deep. They definitively would never venture to the abyssal depth of the drop-off I had seen this one emerge from. As I had this very revelation, the flesh of the dolphin shifted and rippled in both shape, texture, and color. And I saw the thing's eyes burning with a cold and malevolent intelligent that I have never before and have never since witnessed even amongst the worst of mankind. The thing in front of me was no dolphin but rather a clever imposter from some yet unknown secretive species of mollusk. There was a moment where the both of us locked eyes, daring the other to make the first move. A tendril reached out from the mass and grasping my camera, slowly but firmly pulled it from my grasp. Apparently satisfied, the creature jetted away in. Cloud of thick black ink, leaving me to surface without a single speck of proof, evidence, or answers. I fully believe that the only reason I still breathe is that the creature knew my boat's discovery nearby with me missing would bring greater danger to him than I could by myself. Alright, I'm back for a bit. I talked to the old biologist again, we're going to call him Murray to make my life a little bit easier. Now, Murray is a bit of a character. He talks and swears like an old sea captain despite being a marine biologist, and always seems to have a ready excuse for why he has no proof of the things he's apparently seen. I'm not particularly inclined to believe him most days out of the week, but I still find the stories fascinating. I asked him for a bit more in-depth explanation on the creature he saw, and his thoughts on it. His belief is that there is an unknown sentient species of cephalopod in the ocean. Cephalopods are squids, octopus, ECT in case you're wondering. Cephalopods are strange creatures, with a remarkable ability to mimic other forms of life. They also have a level of intelligence that has still to this day not been fully studied or documented. Octopus in the wild and captivity have been recorded to wave back at humans in an almost friendly manner. Supposing that an unknown, intelligent species of cephalopod existed if it did not want to be found, it would be extremely difficult or impossible to find it. Their ability to hide and mimic other forms of life is unmatched, especially if matched with a keen intellect. The creature described by Murray was able to create a near-perfect mimicry of a bottlenose dolphin. This is actually completely within the realm of reality. There is a species of octopus known as the Mimic Octopus that mimics a wide variety of creatures with stunning accuracy. This is achieved via complete control of the shape, texture and color of its body. It's possible that this unknown deep sea mimic is also responsible for the black diver phenomena. A cephalopod of sufficient size could easily mimic human movement and mannerisms from the inside of a wetsuit. The black blood to me indicates that this might be the case. I wonder what these mimics might think of us humans. Invaders from the land. What secrets or mysteries might they hold? Could they have secret cities hidden in great unknown caverns at the bottom of the sea? What purpose does imitating a human diver serve? Are they just observing us, or are their plans more sinister? The entire idea frankly has me a bit on edge. These things could be hiding anywhere, disguised as anything. I might have swam past one a dozen times, been watched by them hundreds. Do they know me? Do they have a name for me? If these things exist, I think it's better that they remain hidden and these questions remain unanswered. I tried to convince Murray of that, but he remains dead set on proving that they exist. There's one more question that's itching at the back of my mind. If it was a cephalopod mimic in that empty diving suit I saw, where the hell did it get the suit? 
they must either scavenge the suits from dead divers, or actively murder divers to steal their suits and gear. I've heard enough stories about murderous octopus to not like where that is going one bit. So if you find yourself often beneath the waves of the ocean as I do, be wary of any unknown divers, and objects that don't belong. So this happened when I am working on a crew doing natural research. Biologists. I am here to make their insurance happy, because I am diving in these waters for many years. Stay near them if they dive, stop the bad things from happening. They are doing research with the, how do you call them? Humboldt squid. My abuelito teach me when I am very young about the Diablo Rojo which you call Humboldt squid. He was a fisherman, my abuelito. Abuelito would always tell me to not be near the water at night, or I will fall in and eaten by Diablo Rojo. These Humboldt squid they are as large as 2 meters, very dangerous. Biologists are working to discover the hunting pattern of the squid. They are using a new sonar to image the squid movements, the data is being inserted to a computer and translates to 3D images. Very nice equipment, very expensive. I think maybe I am here to protect equipment for insurance as much as people. The research was trying to discover why the squid are talking to one another on a hunt. The Diablo Rojo will hunt in a pack of many hundreds, and he swims upward towards the surface in the pack. The sonar was showing a spiraling movements upwards from the deep, searching for prey. Because they are deep squid, the Humboldt must talk to each other from the glowing skin. They change the pattern and each pattern has a meaning, though the researchers do not know it. They are trying to discover what the patterns mean, so they watch the sonar and then I am go down with them to record the squid pattern. There are many different patterns on the squid, some dark edges on the fin of red, some dark red around the eye, some dark red with pale white around the eye. I believe there are maybe 20 variations total in color. There are two dives where we examine the squid and against what my abuelito told me, the Diablo Rojo do not attack us. One does come to feel my arm, but he is not very rough and there is no bite. I think he is tasting me. They have the tongue in their arms, they have eight arms and two tentacle. All squid are like this eight arms and two tentacle. The difference is that the arms have only suckers on the tip, but the tentacle has suckers on the whole of it. The tentacle suckers also have sharp claw in them, for grasping and cutting of their prey. On the third night of sonar recordings, we have an anomaly. The squid pack on sonar does not spiral, but rises up instead straight in a line. Biologists are getting very curious, they have never been seeing this behavior before. So we are diving down to see them, and discover what patterns they have changed because of this behavior. We reach the pack and see something very strange. There is a new pattern of the squid never seen before. The body is white, but below the eye there is a long red streak that runs down from the eye and all into the bottom of their two tentacles. And above the eye on the arrow body of the squid is a shape in red, two lines across diagonal in an X and another line connecting them at the top. Every squid is having this marking and they are all stopped in water that is very shallow for this squid. The biologists are swimming and recording data, take picture, but I am not very happy about this. I am feeling something is wrong, so I tell to them that we are leaving. They refuse to come, so I must stay with them. I am still trying to convince them to leave, when I notice one of the squid has somewhat strangeness to him. He is the largest squid, maybe 8 feet long but that is not what is wrong. He has ten tentacle, not eight arm and two tentacle. All along his limbs are sharp claw suckers, instead of just being at the tip. All squids have the eight arms and two tentacle like I said, so this is not right. I tell to the researcher to come and look at him and I show him how he has ten tentacle. The researcher is very amazed which is when I notice, he actually has two extra tentacle that are hidden together and made to look like a single tentacle. So this squid has 12 tentacle total, but squid are all have only 10 total limbs, with 8 arm and 2 tentacle. The researcher is going to take a closer look, but that is when everything goes very bad. The big squid is very fast and grabs the researcher, 
dragging her down before I can pull my knife. And the entire pack is going into a frenzy flashing red and attacking us, some are pulling at the breathing equipment and I help the two other researchers fighting them away. They are attacking the lights and us and gear very ferociously, but I am trying to fight them with my knife and stabbing at them, one is biting into the head of the guy, but I cut his arm off and he is gone. I am bit many times, and they are cutting me with their sharp arms and tentacle. The old man is bit by a Diablo on the neck, and he is squirting dark green blood from his neck. I pinch the vein shut and pull him up with me, while fighting off another Diablo. He is coming towards me with open arms and tentacles forward, so I stab right into the inside of him but I can feel him grabbing the knife with his beak, and all his arms and tentacle are ripping at me. So I have to let go of the old man, and grab the body of the Diablo, pulling him into my knife. I shred through his guts, he is limp and falls away so I can grab the old man to pinch his blood vessel again, then we swim to the surface. Fortunately we are not needing a long stop for decompression because the dive was not very deep. I am very sad for the woman who was taken by the large squid, she is very nice and beautiful but I am very happy to save the old man who recover after being taken in hospital by Coast Guard. I have to make a lie up to the insurance because the biologist does not want to be refused from doing the research, and if the insurance might know the danger of the squid they will charge many more times the price. Now I am taking my abuelito's advice to avoid the Diablo Rojo, which I should have done many years ago. Never again do I swim at night.